Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this lecture, which is a lecture in the series of public lectures organized by the Master in Disability Studies uh, and organized also in collaboration with the Center for Deaf Studies and our School of English. Welcome also to the Trinity Long Room Hub, the University's Arts and Humanities Research Institute. My name is Jürgen Barkov, I'm the director of this institute and we are very pleased to host this lecture and I personally feel very privileged to have been asked to introduce Professor Davis' lecture on disability and diversity, identity and neoliberalism. A brief word about this institute. Um, one of our aims is to promote and champion collaborate and interdisciplinary work that transcends boundaries and looks at complexities that do not fit the neat divisions of academic disciplines. Because these are, as we all know, often the most interesting and the most challenging issues. The Center for Deaf Studies is part of the School of Linguistics, Speech and Communication Studies, which is one of the seven Arts and Humanities member schools of this institute and the School of Social Work and Social Policy, in which the Master uh, in Disability Studies is based, is a social science school, and one of our remits is to link the humanities and the social sciences. So from this perspective as well, we are very happy to be associated with today's event. Another important element of our work is to foster stronger ties between academic research and wider debates in societies, Debates that, are, that make a real difference to the lives we lead as individuals and as a collective. And we want to show that we offer reflections that society needs. And that includes challenging a too comfortable consensus, because most consensus become problematic if you dig deeper. Issues how we define, perceive, view disabilities, our, the relationship between normalcy and disability, of course, are among those most important and highly contested questions. And the question, what we as a society, how we as a society and a culture relate to people with disabilities is one of the yardsticks of our degree of, of humanity and civilization. It is also, as the title of today's lecture makes reference to, a question of identity. Two weeks ago, in this very room, the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, formally launched a research priority theme for the Trinity Long Room Hub and for the University as a whole on identities in transformation. That's the topic of this research theme. It undertakes a multifaceted investigation how the negotiation of identity is linked to processes of change and transformation. It is an investigation which we hope allows deeper insight into the dynamics between social and political change, um, cultural and societal practices and human agency. One of its six research clusters looks at somatic or embodied identities and investigates the link between identity and the body, emotions, the senses, and undertakes the examination of attitudes towards notions of health, of an illness, of norm and ability and disability. It is one of the aims of our research team to discuss these questions in wider cultural, political and ethical contexts. And of course, Professor Davis' groundbreaking and highly influential work on how concepts like normalcy and diversity relate to deafness and disability is a prime example, an example from which we all can learn on how to frame this discussion in the wider contexts of humanities and social sciences scholarship. I'm very grateful to the organizers of this afternoon's events, Dr. Edurne Garcia Iriarte from Disability Studies at our pioneering National Institute for Intellectual Disability at the School of Social Work and Social Policy, and Dr. Lorraine Leeson from the Center for Deaf Studies, and to Dr. Paul Delaney from the School of English to bringing our speaker here. 
and um, I, I now want to just say a few words about our most distinguished guest speaker. We also have two discussants who will uh, respond to the lecture before we open up the lecture to, um, to, um, to, to a wider discussion with the audience. Um, but I'll, I'll start by profe uh, introducing Professor Leonard J. Davis. He's Professor of English, Disability and Human Development and Medical Education at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's one of the most renowned and most influential scholars internationally in the field of disability studies. And I just mentioned a few of his, of his books that are highly relevant in this regard. Uh, his works on disability include a book, Enforcing Normalcy, Disability, Deafness and the Body, which was published in 1995 and won uh, a couple of uh, awards. Uh, among them, the 1996 Gustav Meyer Center for the Study of Human Rights Annual Award for the best scholarship on the subject of intolerance in North America. He is also the editor of the Disability Studies Reader, which is at this stage in its fourth um, edition and is a standard work. Uh, a collection of his essays enti uh, is entitled Bending Over Backwards, Disability, Dismodernism and Other Difficult Positions, which was published in August 2002. And um, his book Go Ask Your Father, One Man's Obsession to Find Himself, His Origins and the Meaning of Life Through Genetic Testing, was published in 2009 by Random House. Professor Davis, it is a, a great privilege to have you here. We are very much looking forward to your lecture. And please. description? Okay. Um, so I want to thank everybody here who brought me here and all of you for coming. I want to thank uh, Adurne and uh, Jurgen and Paul uh, and uh, I know I'm leaving something out. Uh, Lorraine. Right. So uh, <clears throat> and um, I'm glad to see so many people. Uh, it's, a, it's a testimony I think to uh, many uh, facets of uh, of academic life, but I but I think here an in the interest in disability is and deafness is quite remarkable. Um, so I, I I want to begin this talk uh, by making it a claim that's not only counterintuitive for those who know my work, and I'm, I assume that only some of you do. So I'll I'll explain particularly what I'm talking about. Uh, but if we're living in a, uh, and it might be a form for me of self-heresy, but um, if we're now living in an identity culture eschaton in which people are asking whether we are beyond identity, um, and that's certainly true in the United States, that discussion is going on, then could this development be related in some significant way to the demise of the concept of normality? Is it possible that normal, in its largest sense, which has done such heavy lifting in the area of eugenics, scientific racism, ableism, gender bias, homophobia, and so on, is it possible that normal is playing itself out and losing uh, its utility as a driving force in culture in general and academic culture in particular? And if normal is being decommissioned as a discursive organizer, what replaces it? I will argue that in its place, the term diverse serves as the new normalizing term. Another way of putting this point is, somewhat tautologically, that diversity is the new normality. Before I explain what I mean, I'm obliged to lay out for those of you uh, who are not familiar with my work, uh, what I have asserted in the past. In, in my book, Enforcing Normalcy, uh, Disability, Deafness, and the Body, I argued that normalcy was a category 
that have been and is in force in our culture. I argue that the rise of the concept of normality was tied to the rise of eugenics, statistics, and certain kinds of scientific claims about the body, about the human body, race, gender, class, intelligence, strength, fitness, and morality. I pointed out that the development in the 19th century of the concept of the normal person, l'homme moyen, by Adolphe Quetelet, and I have a picture here of Adolphe Quetelet, um, and the development of the bell curve uh, by Sir Francis Galton, and I have a picture of Sir Francis Galton, and a picture of bell curve. Uh, and um, these acted as both scientific and cultural imp imperatives, socializing people to find their comfort zone under the reassuring and yet disturbing concept of normality. Extremes would be considered abnormal and therefore undesirable. And so you can see in the bell curve, obviously, the norm is in the middle, uh, and the extremes are on the ends, obviously. But Galton recognized correctly that the problem with this bell curve is that something like intelligence, for example, high intelligence would be as abnormal as low intelligence. And given a eugenics uh, orientation, that was a strange use of the bell curve. So Galton's genius was to change the bell curve to an ogive. In other words, what he did, and my next slide shows, is that he flipped the second half of the bell curve so that it goes up, it starts at the bottom, it curves through the normal, and then it rises to the top. When you have something like this, uh, then things like intelligence, uh, physical strength, uh, any of the eugenic things that eugenicists were trying to encourage, now becomes on the high end of things. And obviously, uh, he also divided um, his bell curve up into quartiles and quintiles. And something like our intelligence test, and even our, I don't know what you have here, but in the US, SATs and uh, college entrance exams, now work on the idea of quartiles and quintiles, so you can thank Galton for that. Um, Galton devised the ogive, or the notion of quintiles, because in actuality he was not not promoting normality in the sense of being average, since that also, the word average, could be just another name for mediocrity. Rather, he was promoting a eugenic betterment of the human race by encouraging the mating of people who had a kind of enhanced normality that I would call hypernormality. Galton, um, and, and this is, uh, here are some pictures of what hypernormality might look like. Uh, the, it'll be familiar pictures of very pumped up men, very slim women with large breasts, and men who look like they spend a lot of time in the gym. Um, that's the new hypernormality, which very few of us uh, actually have. Um, Galton used the concept of the normal curve and normality to camouflage what he actually wanted, which was a bigger, smarter, stronger, more dominant human being that corresponded with the putative traits of the dominant social and political classes in a racialized and sexist society. Seeming to be an ideology of democracy and utilitarianism, the norm actually acted as a rationale for rule by elites. Doing that double work of appearing to maintain the democratic ideals while promoting a new kind of inequality, the concept of normality held powerful sway for more than 150 years. It worked very nicely to consolidate the power of nations, uh, institutions, bodies, and cultures over weaker entities, weaker institutions, weaker bodies, and cultures. The mythos of the normal body has created the conditions for the emergence and subjection of the disabled body, the raced body, the gendered body, the classed body, the geriatric body, and so on. And the idea of normal was, uh, was an effective rationale for a monocultural society which could define itself as the norm. In other words, the, the ruling society could define itself as the norm. Um, here's just another picture of the hypernormals. Um, I'll come back to the hypernormals who are supposed to represent all of us. These are young, uh, slim people dancing on a beach. Um, here are some older uh, images of the, hy the hypernormal <coughs> body from, looks like about the 1950s, of uh, more people on the beach 
uh, classic American family types uh, or uh, couples with very slim bodies and very well groomed and all white, of course. Um, yeah, the other reason I have this here, it's a little bit out, a slide out of place, but it's an important part of what I'm discussing, is that uh, I'm going to be showing you a lot of advertising. And um, this ad for the Pepsi generation, some of you may be even old enough to remember it, uh, is the first advertisement that sold a product based on um, what you might call aspirational advertising or a, a lifestyle. Um, before then, if you were selling Pepsi, you would say it tasted better, you would say it was cheaper, came in a bigger bottle. In other words, the quality is that you were trying to sell. But this is the first ad that began a, uh, what I would call it's the beginning of neoliberal advertising, and it's selling a way of life. But it's not selling the product. And so th this ad, if you remember it, and even if you don't, it says, come alive, you're in the Pepsi generation, kind of circa 1962. Um, this is a slide, just to go back to the point of dominant families, the, the, this is a, the slide on the upper left shows a white, uh, obviously upper class family uh, with lots of, you know, uh, with the husband wearing a suit, actually one below two, but, uh, and you know, this is showing us what a fit family looks like. The unfit family is on the lower right is a photograph of Italian immigrants on shipboard coming to the United States. Uh, the, there were actually, in the United States, there were f county fairs in the 1930s uh, that actually had, you know, like the best cow, the biggest uh, pig, and the fittest family. And people competed to win the award of, of the fittest family. And this is very much part of the eugenics idea that's very much tied up with uh, a norm and standard in, in which immigrants, indigenous peoples, people of color, and foreigners were always going to be abnormal and were proven to be so using eugenically oriented biometric tests and creative solutions to anomalous data that might indicate otherwise. So I'm not saying, and this is an important thing, I'm not saying all of this is over. The replacement of diverse for normal is a process of uneven development. Nor am I saying that it's a bad thing. Uh, the idea of diversity has many things to recommend it over the concept of normal. On the surface, we're better off abandoning some universal standard for bodies and cultures and acknowledging that there isn't one regnant or ideal body or culture, that all are in play concerning each other and should be equally valued. Diversity is in fact a much more democratic concept, seemingly, than normality since diversity applies to the broad range of the population rather than normality, which of course eschews the abnormal. But it would be naive to see diversity as without ideological content. Diversity is well suited to the core beliefs of neoliberalism. If neoliberalism is premised on a culture in which lifestyle and cho choice predominate, then as Kimlicka, Will Kimlicka writes, liberals extol the virtues of having a diversity of lifestyles within a culture, so presumably they also endorse the additional diversity which comes from having two or more cultures in the same country. So while normality was enforced to make people conform to some white, Eurocentric, ableist, developed world, heterosexual, male, notion of normality, diversity imagines a world without a ruling gold standard of embodiment. How then, given the ideal of openness concerning diversity, where all are welcomed under the big tent of a diverse nationhood, do disabled bodies fit into this paradigm? I'm going to show you. So uh, my slides here are uh, images that you might see commonly to s for diversity. And uh, the one on the left says, celebrate diversity. The one on the right has one, two, three, four, five hands each one clasping each other at the ankles to form a, a pentagon, maybe? Uh, and uh, different colored hands. And there is another image of different colored hands, and then there's another one of different colors, of abstract one of, of an earth, uh, or a circle with different striated colors, and then the striation of colors of people uh, standing on that earth and spoking out from it in different ways. Um, 
And this is important. I mean, like the images of diversity is something that is always tied up with celebration. Um, this is just another variation of that. It's a poster that shows lots of different types of guns. In America, we like guns. And it says, celebrate diversity. Um, there's another slide here that shows, uh, uh, is divided diagonally. It's a square di divided diagonally down the middle. And on the lower right-hand corner are all a group, group of people, all of whom are white and all of whom look the same. And in the uh, upper left-hand corner is a group of people. It's a cartoon of, of people of different races uh, or ethnicities. And they all look different, and there's lots of different colors. And it says on the top, to prevent boredom, life offers many opportunities to interact with a wide variety of people. So why do we choose to only hang around with those who are just like us? Nobody likes to be bored, do they? And this sort of embodies one of the rationales for diversity in education and other areas, that it, you know, diversity is more interesting. Right, I'm now going to show you a, uh, a, a little um, vignette. It, this comes, uh, so part of me, my, the question I want to do, I want to look at this the popular culture. And uh, there's, in the US there, and I don't know if you have it here, well, you probably don't, but uh, do you have Walmart here? Not yet. Not yet, okay, hang on. So, uh, <laughs> so Walmart and Dove, do you have Dove? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, so, so Walmart and Dove have combined kind of a unthinkable, but to, um, to uh, with an ad campaign that's called Campaign for Real Beauty. And if you go online, they have a website. It's fascinating, actually. Uh, but the whole concept is that, it, I mean, the, the, the kind of veneer of it is that everyone's beautiful, and we don't have to f conform to any particular standard of beauty. It's directed toward women, obviously. And the idea, OK, so let's just look at it, and then I will have some comments to make. Um, oh, no, back up. Okay. Fill your eyes with wide. Does your nose go to the side? Does your elbow have the crinkle? Do your knees sort of wrinkle? Does your chest tend to freckle? Do you have a crooked smile? Do your eyes sit wide? Do your ears sort of wiggle? Does your hair make you giggle? Does your neck cool? Do your hips sing a song? Do your ears? Okay, I mean, I could do an entire class on this ad. Uh, just for uh, some, the deaf people in the audience, I have a little bit of the lyrics, but not all of them here. Um, do I? No, just that. Okay. So, um, okay, first of all, uh, obviously, the, the, you know, they want to sell something, and they want to sell Dove beauty products to poor women. Uh, I mean, that's the, the goal. Um, the advertisement shows us a diversity of women of color and national origins. A lesbian couple, a somewhat transsexual looking woman playing basketball, an older woman, as well as the usual white mother and daughter. All the women are full of life, engaging, but not beautiful from run by one runway standards. And the message being promulgated is that there is no normal when it comes to a woman's appearance. Diversity is all. And we can say that the key to the neoliberal subject is that when we visualize such bodies, we see them ipso facto as diverse, but within certain constraints, as I will show. This advertisement reflects a trend to embrace the diversity of the human body within certain kinds of limits set by television and Hollywood, cherry-picking the aspects of diversity that appeal to a regnant paradigm. But while celebrating diverse bodies, the ads nowhere show us women with disabilities. Uh, uh, this is the website, by the way, uh, which shows um, three uh, women who are supposed to be uh, abnormal. I mean, they're actually, I mean, in the sense that they don't conform to runway standards, but they're, they're attractive, they're in their underwear. Uh, and I guess the point is that they're somewhat full-bodied, uh, or I'm not quite sure what the term is. And it says, uh, we see beauty all around us. Um, OK, but so what we don't see is uh, uh, women with disabilities, obese, anorectic, depressed, cognitively or effectively disabled. And I have a selection of 
pictures of women who might reflect that, those descriptions. Um, the concept of diversity currently is rendered operative largely by excluding groups that might be thought of as abject or hyper-marginalized. It's difficult to imagine a commercial like the one that I've shown that would include homeless people, uh, impoverished people, end-stage cancer patients, the comatose, heroin, crack, or methamphetamine addicts. These groups fall into a category that might be called bare life, or zoe, in, uh, the, in the terminology of Giorgio Agamben, uh, Agamben's work. Agamben distinguishes between bios, uh, or life in the polis or a political state, and zoe, which is bare life, which can be killed without sanction. Uh, and this is from Agamben's book, Homo Saker, which is a very interesting book. Uh, recommend it. Zoe is a life defined as not worthy of life, not worth living. For Agamben, though, the project of modernity and postmodernity is an attempt to reclaim Zoe to bios, to create a biopolitics that involves technologies of life that recuperate Zoe to some kind of political moment. But the question I want to ask is does diversity do the work of reclaiming Zoe? In some serious sense, we have to say it does not. I want to make clear that I do believe that it's a good thing we're moving toward promoting diversity and away from enforcing normalcy, but there is also a, there's a political and social progress in thinking of humans as diverse rather than normal or abnormal. But in accepting this change, we should by no means feel that the new model avoids the pitfalls of what Foucault calls technologies of life. It would be difficult to imagine that diversity is so different a concept that it could vo avoid the larger project of modernity, which according to Foucault, is the creation of docile, compliant bodies. One could argue that there is as much social conditioning, care of and for the body, subjection of the body, involved in this version of imagining the diverse human than in the previous regime. Indeed, it would be naive to assume that any contemporary form of social organization does not carry with it elements of control and categorization, no matter how progressive it might seem at the time. If there are elements of social control in the idea of diversity, I would argue we can best see them by looking at how disability fits in, and I should say deafness too, fits in or does not fit into the category of diversity. To begin this, I want to point to a dichotomy between the kind of subjectivity implied by diversity compared to the subjectivity given to disability. Uh, my point here is that the idea of diversity is linked to a postmodern concept of subjectivity as being malleable, mobile, and capable of being placed on a continuum, complex, socially constructed, and with a strong element of free play and choice. In contrast to this, mutability, disability, and deafness are seen as fixed, sharply defined by medical diagnosis, and sometimes assigned to an abject position sometimes, of, 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 of Zoe. Or, I will elaborate on this point for the remainder of this talk, but I want to signal now the end run of this argument, which is that while diversity is the regnant ideology, the older concept of normal still holds sway, but only when it comes to disability, particularly when disabled subjectivity is constructed through medical models. Therefore, the ultimate question I raise is whether diversity can ever encompass disability, which is another way of saying, can diversity ever encompass abnormality, or can bios ever encompass zoe? Sorry, I speak quickly. Um, <laughs> hard work for the interpreters. Um, to start discussing this general topic, I want to focus on the way that diverse subjectivity is constructed in general. As I noted in postmodernity, what we can say about identities within diversity is that they are always situated as complex, intersectional, and socially constructed, not as fixed or rigid. In this sense, it would seem that the older reign of normal, with its simple and rigid notion of norm, could never apply to a postmodern identitarian subjectivity. There are, of course, identities that concern nationality, religion, and even party affiliation. But the pressing identities, in the US at least, concern some aspect of embodiment, race, gender, sexuality. 
In these areas, postmodern thought has therefore eschewed thinking of such bodily categories as tied to an essential self. In the case of race, we now use the word racialized to account for groups formerly thought of as belonging to a race. We now say definitively, based on genetic findings, that there is no such thing as biological race, but of course there is still racism. Under these conditions, in some sense, we are thinking of race as something complexly social. Yet, there still is a return to genetics concerning race, which we now call populations, um, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, yet no one would dare to say that one population was normal and another one was not. Even popular television confounds the old idea of race by showing that Oprah, Skip Gates, or Sally Hemings' children are complexly made up of diverse genetic provenances. Oh. Um, so it seems clear that postmodern identities... Actually, let me show you this. This is a... Uh, it's the work of a disabled artist named Jess Sa uh, Sachs. And, uh, you know, you've seen American Apparel ads. So this, this is a woman who is, her, her body is uh, clearly not the typical runway model type. And she's, and she's parroting American Apparel ads. It says American Able. And it's just, uh, so on the one hand, it's, it's an interesting parody, and it's sort of a, uh, an, in some sense, quite amusing. Um, uh, send up of the normal advertising, but it also shows you how far we are from being able to actually see this ad for real in, out, th out there. Um, uh, so uh, part of my intellectual or, uh, you know, mind experiment is to see what kinds of substitutions could you do with the sort of celebrate diversity model. So, I mean, could you like, celebrate, uh, you know, Tay-Sachs disease? Um, you know, you could just fill in blanks and say, like, what could you substitute in the celebrate uh, area? Um, so, it seems clear that postmodern identities are less bound to an embodied, fixed, assigned self and more to the socially constructed, technologically intervened body, which, as scholars like Victoria Pitts Taylor have pointed out, one can choose to have. In other words, an older model of identity, and one tied to the ideology of normal, might be considered essentialist and hierarchical, whereas the newer notion of identity appears to be chosen, constructed, and in the sense democratic. Um, gender and sexual identities are clearly embodied, but now they are seen equally as complex as race. We understand through thinkers like Judith Butler that gender is a performative category. Writers like Judith Halberstam and Leslie Feingold teach us that gender is on a continuum and that sexual identities need not be tied to a specific kind of body. Queer and transgender studies have shown us that a single notion of normality is a procrustean bed in which no one really sleeps and from which everyone kicks off the covers. Genetics shows that that joke never works. I don't know. <laughs> Did no, the people no longer know who Procrustes was? <laughs> he, yeah, well, look it up. Uh, genetic, <laughs> genetics show us that there are a variety of chromosomal identities that don't fit so easily into the gender binary <laughs> created under the reign of normality. By and large, diversity is dependent on, on a notion of what I have called the biocultural. By a biocultural model, I want to, want to indicate the complexity of embodied identity. Bodies can be the sum of their biology, they can be the sum of the signifying systems in the culture, the historical, social, political surround, the scientific defining points, the symptom pool, uh, a term that I particularly like, symptom pool would be the symptoms available in any given culture at any given moment, uh, which are, can be quite different between cultures. Um, the technological add-ons all combined and yet differentiated. As Deleuze and Guattari point out, the body is perhaps best thought of as a body without organs, a machine that produces effects. I mean, that's the most postmodern concept in a way of the body. And more recently, Jasbir Puar has asked us to think of the queer body as a series of assemblages. In contrast to this roving, complex, and shifting nature of identity that's part of the notion of the diverse, we run into a very different notion of disability. Disabled bodies are, in the current imaginary, construct as, constructed as fixed identities. Outside of the hothouse of disability studies, which, you know, is our small little greenhouse, and science studies, impairments are commonly seen. 
by many people as medically determined and certainly not socially constructed. This may be because disability is not seen as an identity, and deafness too, in the same way that we may see race, gender, and other embodied identities. And the reason for this is that disability and deafness are largely perceived as, in, as medical problems and not as a way of life involving choice. We may want diversity in all things, but we don't want it insofar as medicalized bodies are concerned. It is in this realm that normal still applies with force. Most people still want normal cholesterol, blood pressure, and bodily functions. The word one most wants to hear from an obstetrician after a birth is that the baby is normal. No one is advocating a celebration of high blood pressure or cancer, although we do celebrate people who are fighting cancer. Uh, there's no celebration of chronic illness and debilitating conditions. The area of normal not only applies to physical disabilities, but cognitive and affective disorders as well. The current DSM and the next one have elaborated a dizzying display of lifestyle illnesses that demand medical treatment to cure and normalize people. Sadness, shyness, obsession, sexual desire, anger, adolescent rebellion, and the like now fall under a bell curve whose extreme has become pathologies curable by drugs for the most part. Surgical and pharmaceutical interventions are designed to return normalcy or the appearance of normalcy to aberrant bodies. Short children in the United States are now increasingly given drugs to increase their height, and shortness is now seen as a hormone deficiency covered by medical insurance. We don't celebrate crooked teeth. We correct them to their normal position to their normal, in quotes, position. Um, we can argue that our tolerance for variation in the medicalized realm is far less flexible and inclusive than it is in regard to race and gender. Only in rare cases, uh, such as a group called the Icarus Project in the United States, is something like bipolar depression celebrated. And only within the inner circle of autists and their parents is there a move to embrace autism in fact, calling it a form of neurodiversity. Because disability is tied to the medical paradigm, it's seen as a form of the abnormal, or what you might, I might call the undiverse. I say undiverse because diversity implies celebration and choice. To be disabled, you don't get to choose. You have to be diagnosed, and in many cases, you will have an ongoing and very defining relationship with the medical profession. In such a context, Disability will not be seen as a lifestyle or an identity, but as a fixed category. In such a context, disability, oh sorry, in thinking of it, so what I'm trying to say is that, um, uh, for, not within disability studies, but in general, people see disability uh, or deafness as something that w with it, that's not involved in choice. And I'm going to elaborate the fact that choice, as you know, I, I'm, I'm talking about in neoliberal culture, is a very important concept. Um, and, uh, you know, in a way, it, 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 I was, it, it might, you might think of it as a, an issue about, if you want to talk about it in, a, in another context, about fate and free will, uh, that disability seems to be something tied up with fate, whereas, whereas other kinds of choices seem to be tied up with free will. Uh, but that's not in the context of this neoliberal consumer culture that I'm discussing. Um, in thinking about the situation, we can return to Giorgio Agamben, but this time to his discussion of the state of exception. Agamben notices in a somewhat paradoxical way that, quote, in order to apply a norm, it is ultimately necessary to suspend its application to produce an exception. In this view, it's not so much that normality has been replaced by diversity, but that normality has been suspended in a state of exception. The fact that normality exists for disability, but not for the rest of neoliberal diversity, shows us that disability is the state of exception that undergirds our very idea of diversity. Agamben is using the state of exception to describe how governments have suspended laws or rendered them inutile by not enforcing them in order to deal with extraordinary circumstances such as the war on terrorism. So I think we've all seen that, or you know, that our so-called our civil liberties and rights to privacy and stuff have been suspended in order to maintain democracy and freedom. So that state of exception is what uh, Agamben is talking about, and that state of exception actually can remain permanent, uh, paradoxically, right? Nonetheless, I think the idea of the state of exception 
is applicable to the realm of social organization. In this scenario, the norm is suspended because it is so clearly a sign of sovereignty and power that previously the norm had been so tied up with this eugenic control, right? So it has to be suspended. And an ethic of diversity can now fill its place, which seems much more consonant with the aims and goals of a, of a democracy that places emphasis on equality. We're all equal in this diverse world. No one group reigns supreme. But the state of exception, so created, operates tacitly by a fusion of the old regulatory form of norm and the new openness of diversity, which means on some level that diversity isn't as open as it purports to be. As Agamben puts this, and this will be the last of Agamben, uh, the impossible task of welding norm and reality together, and thereby constituting the normal sphere, is carried out by the form of exception, that is to say, by presupposing their nexus. So there's a, con for, for Agamben, there's a connection between norm and its suspension. But it is disability that reveals the state of exception as that by, being, by its being continuously connected with the exception of the norm. Disability seen as a state of abjection or a condition in need of medical repair or cure is the resistant point in the diversity paradigm. In other words, you can't have a statement like, we are all different and we celebrate that diversity without some idea of a norm that defines the difference in the first place. It seems impossible to have difference without some standard that sets what is different apart from what is not different. You can't say we're all different unless you have some kind of concept of difference, which means that you know, you're suppressing a concept of the norm. No one could argue that given time and education, people will come to see, as we do in, as we do in disability studies, that disability is an identity, a way of life, and not simply a violation of a medical norm. Yet in this talk, I want to argue for what seems like a certain incommensurability between the celebration of diversity and the normalization of disability. For diversity to be able to embrace disability, it will take more than consciousness raising. I am saying it will take a paradigm shift. So what would that paradigm shift look like? I would argue that in the current moment, the identity touted by diversity is always this... Um, is always a healthy, able one, a uh, whole one, in accordance with the technologies of life, lifestyle, and the ability to be represented with accepting, accepted, accept, acceptably uplifting images. Diversity, given the images displayed in the popular media, and I'm looking at a series of, uh, now I'm looking at a series of Benetton ads. This particular one has a, um, a, 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 a blonde white woman, a uh, Asian looking baby, and an African woman, I believe, all wrapped up in a green and purple blanket together. Um, so the, the images that we have are multicultural people holding hands of women such as in the Dove and proudly, happily celebrating their difference only reinforces the dichotomy I am showing you. Here's another picture from the Benetton ad of a, uh, a, a, you can't see, it's a woman whose breasts are exposed, her skin is a black or a dark brown, and the baby is very white that she's holding, he's nursing on her. Um, the images we have of multicultural people holding hands and so on, uh, it may be hard to see this, but they're participating in a state of exception uh, that may indeed be reinforcing in different ways the norm. This is another slide of just people, many people of different colors, and this <laughs> phrase is all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Article one, I guess, of the UN Charter. Um, Here I want to introduce the idea of multicultural and multi-ethnic identity into this discussion. When progressives describe a multicultural society, they imagine one in which there is no culture that is better than another. We shouldn't have a hierarchy of cultures, and this goes along with my idea of choosing, that any, any culture is choosable. You, know, you, may, you may not be in that culture, but there's no culture that's any better than anyone else. So there's a tension between the idea of fixed identity, which must be situated on a grid of better or worse, normal or abnormal, and the postmodern malleable identity with no judgment of better or worse. <laughs> that is, under the old logic of normal, there are groups that are standard and groups that aren't. In the ideology of diversity, all groups are potentially equal and potentially choosable. 
within the ideology of diversity, it isn't better to be an Afghani than it is to be a Sudanese. It isn't better to be a Christian than a Jew or a North Korean than a South Korean. One may prefer to be, say, Arab rather than European, but that is because one has a cultural heritage and an identity one knows and likes, not because Semitic bodies or minds are proven scientifically or otherwise to be better than Caucasian ones. So the old scientific justification for racism is no longer widely accepted. So if identities are, for the most part, no longer fixed, then theoretically one has a choice to choose one identity over another. I want to highlight this idea of choice. Individual choice is a central notion of neoliberal ideology, related as it is to consumer society and the ability to choose products, lifestyle, clothing, and so on. In our society, ironically, we choose clothing, music, hairstyles, and accessories to show our individuality. More, uh, this is just another slide from the Benetton series of lots of slim, young uh, people of different colors. Uh, and then a picture of a, an African woman um, looking like she's wearing some kind of African uh, traditional clothing. Uh, and on her head is either uh, written or uh, imposed. This, uh, 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 this is a Benetton ad also, I think, that says, choose your music. Um, we choose clothing, music, hairstyles, and accessories to show our individuality. I say ironically because, of course, these are mass-produced items that large groups of people can purchase. Michael Peters points out that welfare and social well-being are viewed as products of individual choice within a free market economy. Choice is a central myth-theme in the neoliberal ideology of freedom, in which we're all free to buy any object we can afford. And we're actually, the, the advertising actually works, there's something called aspirational advertising, which is to advertise products that you can't possibly afford. But what it does is, it, it, it uh, you know, overvalues or increases the value of a brand. So they know that the majority of people are not going to be able to buy these really expensive, you know, Mercedes or Lexus or whatever. But the advertisement is to create aspirations uh, within the culture. Um, the other thing I want to make clear is that I'm not kind of doing an old Adorno, Horkheimer argument about how we're all dupes. I mean, I'm, I'm really more going in a kind of Foucault-esque argument that this is something we want to do. You know, I mean, I am a proud owner of an Apple product. Um, I was happy to get it. I was willing to spend the money. And I felt good about myself and my compares for owning it. So in other words, it's not something that's being imposed on you. It's actually much more like Dante's idea of the, the damned rushing into hell, you know, <laughs> because on their own volition. Um, and so I think what's important is this idea that, uh, that in neoliberal consumer society, we, uh, w we do these things uh, to create a self through consumerism, consumer's choice. Um, so if we move from purchasable, purchasable signs of identity to collective group identities, we can say that there are identities we can choose and identities for which there is no choice. And I've indicated that disability is not an identity one chooses. Um, I'm just going to skip over this section here. Uh, so, um, but the point I'm skipping over is, is this issue about uh, how uh, multicultural society is viewed in uh, US and in Europe. I mean, I think it's important, but I'm, I, I, the, the general take-home message of it is that even though there are certain uh, 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 kinds of identities that are tied up with ethnicity and with religion and so on, they ultimately fit into this paradigm of, of, of potential choosability. Uh, whereas, um, uh, and, uh, whereas disability does not. Um, so I want to interrogate the concept of diversity itself. And I want to offer, it, that is an intellectual idea, it doesn't have much to offer. The work of the concept is rather simply put, we are all humans, diverse as we may be. In that sense, uh, although our diversity is a sign of our difference, it's also a sign of our sameness, the sameness of being human. This is a proposition that few will disagree with. There's a built-in contradiction to the idea of diversity in neoliberal ideology, which holds first and foremost that each person is a unique individual. Individualism does not meld easily into the idea of group identity. And yet, for neoliberalism, it must. 
In a diverse world, one must be part of a different group, ethnic, gender, race, sexual. It's boring, as that earlier slide showed, to be part of a non-diverse, usually dominant group. So diversity demands different, difference so it can claim sameness. We're all different, therefore we're all the same, is the central tautology or paradox. The problem with diversity is that it really needs two things to survive as a concept, just as neoliberalism needs this. It needs to imagine a utopia in which difference will disappear. While living in a presence, presence, present that is obsessed with difference. And it needs to suppress everything that confounds this vision. What is suppressed from the imaginary of diversity, a suppression that actually creates neoliberal diversity, are various forms of inequality, notably economic inequality, as well as a question of power. The power and wealth difference is nowhere to be found in this neoliberal view of diversity. But what is also suppressed is disability, particularly a notion of disability without cure. In this sense, disability, along with poverty, represents that which must be suppressed for diversity to survive as a concept. In a more schematic sense, difference must be suppressed to maintain diversity, which ultimately seeks sameness. Thus, we are all different, therefore we are all the same, becomes we are all the same because we aren't that kind of different. And that kind of different would refer to that which cannot be chosen the intractable, stubborn, resistant, and yet constitutive part of neoliberal capitalism, that is to say, zoe, bare life, the ethnic other, the disabled, that which cannot be transmitted into the neoliberal subject of postmodernity. Ultimately, what I'm arguing is that disability is an identity that is unlike all the others in that it resists change and cure. Uh, by the way, I mean, that's not entirely true. And, and uh, for example, if you think about deafness, uh, I think if you think about deafness, you know, uh, the majority of people who are deaf uh, um, are, are not looking for a cure. Um, but with the advent of cochlear implants, uh, the, you know, the, the issue of deafness is being transmuted into something that can be gotten rid of or cured. The identity side of deafness is not being paid attention to for the 95% of parents who have a, a, a deaf child born to them who are hearing. 95% of the parents of deaf children are hearing. But for them, now, in this new era of cochlear implants, deafness is seen as the choice. Suddenly there's a choice. So it becomes a consumer product. We know that cochlear implants are very expensive. Uh, even Someone's paying for it, even if it's the National Health Service. And um, so... so Parents are presented with, your child is deaf, but the good news is that they can be cured using cochlear implants. And so it's a consumer product. There's advertising for it. There are manuals that are given out to parents and who are gotten very early on in the process when they've just, they can now detect a deafness at a very early age, a month, even less than a month. And the parents are told this, uh, that their child is deaf, but they're immediately sent to an audiologist and uh, a surgeon for cochlear implants. So it's an interesting point where uh, if it's curable, um, then it, fits, it slides over into the diversity paradigm. You have a choice. Uh, and um, that's also getting to be true for certain kinds of mobility impairments. Um, I have more to say about that, but I'm gonna, I'll save that. Um, so, so what I'm arguing is that disability is, and deafness are, in, are, to the extent that, that, that deafness is something that resists change and cure, uh, are not part of diversity. Um, and, and these things, disability and deafness, are atavisms, representing the remainder of normal at the end of normal. But as such, it isn't an anomaly, but rather the capstone, I would argue, that upholds the arch of postmodernity. It is the difference that creates the fantasy of a world in which we are so diverse that we become the same. As such, paradoxically, it upholds meaning and significance because without difference, there can't be meaning. Thus disability, I mean, in, at least in a structural sense, right? Uh, a binary opposition. Uh, thus disability is the ultimate modifier of identity, holding identity to its original meaning of being one with oneself, which is, after all, the foundation of difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Davis. Um, I, I now have the pleasure to introduce the two discussants who will offer a response to this talk before uh, we open up for uh, uh, a wider discussion. The first discussant, discussant is John Konama, who holds a BA in MLIT and a PhD in Social Policy and was the former chairperson of the Irish Deaf Society. He has been involved in many committees and working groups within the civil service and other government bodies to monitor the progress of deaf and disabled people in society. <laughs> his, his doctorate from UCD of, in 2006 focused on a comparative policy analysis of signed languages in Finland and Ireland and he has been involved in many policy initiatives around sign language here in Ireland. And his recent work focuses on deaf people in society, for instance, the level of poverty within the deaf community. Donald Tulin, who will speak after, um, after John, is an actor and broadcast journalist whose own life experiences have shaped and informed his involvement with groups interested in the progression of human rights. He founded the Forum of People with Disabilities in Ireland in 1990 and was instrumental in negotiating with the Irish government the establishment of a commission on the status of people with disabilities. Many of us will have seen his RTE radio or we will have heard his RTE radio programs not so different. He was awarded National Broadcast Journalist of the Year and he has worked on other critically acclaimed radio documentary series. During Mary Robinson, Robinson, Robinson's presidency he was a member of the President's Council of State. He was on the boards of the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, the Institute for Design and Disability and is currently on the advisory board for our Masters in Disability Studies. So, um, so the first response is from John. Roving mic? Where is our roving mic? Otherwise we take this one. <coughs> So I just want to switch position. Okay, so just want to make sure I'm in the right position. I right. can see. My first response is, I suppose maybe it was mentioned already, but I mean there's obviously lots of ideas and concepts in there. And I hope my response is, you know, in, in some way it's kind of just you know justifies that, that sheer amount of thinking that's in that and generates some discussion. So there's lots there that I can choose from. And I mean, obviously the, the idea of, you know, is diversity the new normality, I think is, is looking very appropriate. Um, I think as well, there needs to be a lot more time to sit down and tease out some of these issues, but this is just you know, my good my reaction. I've made some notes through the presentation. Uh, your use of the concept of bios and zoe uh, are, are new to me. It's the first time that I've seen that idea incorporated, and you know the life that's not worth living, that can be eradicated without a second thought. You know, as applied to people with disabilities and impairments, seems very apt, and I suppose it leads leads me to a lot of, of further thinking on that. Um, I've been thinking of two recent examples that are relevant. The Law Reform Commission recently published a report, which discussed jury service. And one of the chapters in the report talks about the possibility of bringing a deaf person onto a jury. So that's the first example I want to look at. And there's another example which relates to cochlear implants, which are a very emotive and controversial subject still. <coughs> so in relation to the jury service issue, 
This chapter talked about a deaf person who recently challenged her, uh, their exclusion from the jury, and there was lots of discussions around that, and the report um, came to the conclusion that as long as it, as it was a non-criminal case, then the deaf person could be involved, so it was kind of a civil case, which I thought was an interesting conclusion, because it, it looked like, well, a deaf person still isn't fit to sit on a criminal case, because there will be an interpreter there, you know, this 13th person of the jury. So, you know, and to be involved in the discussions in the, in the jury room and so on and so forth. So, you know, the public response to that was interesting because I'm sure many of you know the journal.ie, it's kind of a news and current affairs discussion website. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, you know, the scope to make public comments on some of the articles. And a lot of the responses there was, you know, why would we have a deaf person in a jury? The expense of providing an interpreter for that. And is it worth it? And, you know, it kind of looks like, you know, the, the idea there is that deaf people aren't worth becoming citizens, that there's, you know, it's too much responsibility mm -hmm. on the state. So I think it's maybe an example of Zoe there, you know, you know, a life maybe not worth living. So that's my first example I wanted to mention. And I also wanted to mention the copter implant issue. Mm -hmm. And there is a group of parents um, that have been set up and they call themselves Happy to Hear. And they're fighting mm -hmm. a campaign against the health mm -hmm. service policy here in Ireland, which is that children are, uh, receive one copter implant as opposed to two, mm -hmm. as opposed to bilateral implants. So I suppose they've been continuing their work. But what's interesting is the public response to their story. That's terrible. The state will only fund one copular implant, one, mm. one implant per child. How is that even possible? Mm. So, you know, the, the discussion about, you know, the taxpayer funding this is, 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 is dismissed. All that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who pays for it. It needs to be paid for. I think that is a very clear example of what is considered to be worthy life, you know, by us versus Zoe, and what is considered worthy of support versus worthy of dismissal. So it really does make me, you know, pause for thought. Neoliberalism obviously has huge power and influence mm. now. And I suppose one, one question I'd like to ask Professor Vegas is, you know, in relation to neoliberalism, it really has got very much its claws into this notion of diversity. And I'm just wondering, are there kind of if, uh, are there other kind of schools of thought that maybe would have influenced other models of diversity? You know, socialism, communism, feminism. Um, I'm just wondering. Mm. Uh, does it always have to have that same rooting in those attitudes that we've seen in the lecture? I know it's, my response is, is I suppose, brief, and I'd like to have a lot more time to discuss the, the points that have come up, but that's my, my, my brief response. Okay, thank you. Thank you.